We are concluding our series on faith like a child. We often say here, win the kids, win the culture. And that's our emphasis on making a faith impact in kids. But this series is about having faith like children. In fact, um, for the last, the three weeks of this series, we haven't had Sunday school for first to fifth graders, in part because um, we wanted the kids to be in here for this series. Um, as Pastor Brian said a couple weeks ago, children remind us of opportunities to be transformed, to demonstrate humility, and to honor Jesus. Um, again, he contrasted what it is to be childish, which is to be selfish, to be a know-it-all, to be insensitive, to be demanding, versus childlike faith, which is trusting and uh, dependent and innocent and honest and inquisitive. And last week, Pastor John mentioned that children are better equipped to, to uh, follow Jesus because children are already followers. I want to read, uh, each week we've read uh, Matthew 18, 1 to 5. I want to read that, but before I do, I'm going to ask any children or kids who are fifth grade and younger to stand. I need kids who are fifth grade and younger to stand up and then I need the rest of you to identify one near you and, wa- and look at them while, we read, while I read this passage from Matthew chapter 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called the child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Now, kids, stay standing just for a second. Now, look at the kids, and there's a little bit of an irony here because we are raising these kids to become adults, and that's good. It's a good thing. It needs to happen. But as we are raising these kids to become more like us, Jesus says to us, you need to become more like them. Uh, Kids, you can have a seat. You can have a seat. Thank you very much. This morning, we're going to read a familiar story. It's the feeding of the 5,000. I've entitled this message, A Supersized Happy Meal, because a little boy brings his meal, and Jesus does something miraculous with it. And so our scripture reader uh, this morning is Scout Irby. Scout, if you can make your way on on up, Uh, to the podium. As he does, I'm going to ask all of you who are able to please stand and face the center of the room. If you have your Bibles and want to turn to John chapter 6, I would encourage you to do that. Um, But we stand because we believe that this is the Word of God. And so, Scout, whenever you are ready, please read from John chapter 6. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed on by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up to a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how will they, how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, And they sat down by about 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. 
he did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by the people who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into this world. Scout, great job. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Yeah, and Scout, you can come on up here. We're going to reenact this miracle, okay? Going to reenact it. Now, there's a real good chance that the disciples mentioned the story were probably in their teens. So I've recruited, I haven't recruited, Brett recruited, but we have some junior high students here. Come on up, junior high students. Junior high disciples, just stand right back here. Now, the story says that Jesus fed them with bread and fish. Now, to reenact this and feed all of you with bread and fish, that could get, well, let's just be honest, it'd get really ugly, okay? A bunch of fish in here, okay? So, uh, but I decided what I would do is I would take the concept of bread and fish and mix them together. And so what we are going to use this morning is fishy crackers, okay? Fishy crackers, bread, fish, works for me, okay? All right, so... Um, Scout, I'm going to have you, it said he had uh, two fish and five loaves of bread, so you get seven bags of fishy crackers, okay? There's your lunch. Great job. Just stay right there with that Scout, okay? Now, while Jesus miraculously produced enough food for 5,000, his miracle does not include distribution, a little bit of an oversight in his part, okay? So it's one thing to create food for 5,000 people, it's another thing to distribute it. Um, and so for that, he used his disciples. And the people sat down, the story said, and disciples brought the food to them. Now, they were distributing to 5,000 men. It doesn't include the women and children. So I think it's safe to say you could add another 5,000. So we're distributing to 10,000 people. The gospel doesn't say when it, whether, when it says the disciples distributed the food, is that the 12 apostles Or is it the 70, you know, there was another time that Jesus sent out 70 disciples. Was it the 12? Was it the 70? Um, Doesn't really say. But this morning, I don't know, there's about four or 500 of you in here. Um, We have five students. That's a ratio of 1 to 80 to 1 to 100. Now, even if there were 70 disciples distributing the food to 10,000 people, the ratio of that would be larger than what they have to do this morning. Um, So, Scout, what I'm going to have you do, we're going to perform a miracle. You are all about to be amazed at what we're going to do here. So, Scout, go ahead and give each of the disciples a bag of fishy crackers. And you can give a couple because we need to get rid of all of them. Okay. Scout, you did a great job. You can go ahead and have a seat. Let's hear it for Scout. You did a great job. So now, disciples, this is where we need you to really come through for us, okay? We're going to pretend that Jesus is back on the ramp. And somehow, in a way that nobody will figure out how we did this, you're going to go down that side of the ramp with one bag of fishy crackers or two, and you're going to walk down to the bottom of the ramp with a whole basket full. It's a miracle. It's going to be a miracle. So go ahead, guys. Have Jesus work his miracle back there. Look at that. A miracle right before your eyes. We have no idea how that happened. Uh, The ramp area is forbidden for the rest of the morning. You're not allowed to go up there, okay? Um, So... We are going to have them pass out these fishy crackers. Now, there are regular cheesy fishy crackers and pretzel, che- uh, pretzel fishy crackers. You get what you get. Okay, so go ahead, guys. Go on ahead. Hand out. Everyone needs to get one, okay? While, oh, the other thing I'm just going to mention is that if you guys want to eat these while we uh, continue, you are allowed to. I just ask... Um, that you are really careful that you don't get any on the floor, on the chairs, pick up your garbage after you, uh, because in the story, the people didn't have to worry about cleanup. Uh, we do. So if you wouldn't mind helping us with that, that would be great. 
But while they are doing that, I just want to kind of give you a little bit of idea of where this happened. Uh, this happened in Israel. We have a map, okay? And um, what we have here is you have the Sea of Galilee, you have the Jordan River, you have the Dead Sea, um, you have the Mediterranean Sea here, um, and then you have places like Bethlehem in the south where Jesus was born, Jerusalem also just a little bit north of there, that's where Jesus died, and uh, uh, resurrected. Most of his ministry happened, however, in the Galilean region. So we have a close-up of the Galilean region there. And um, the best, there's, no one knows exactly where the feeding of the 5,000 took place, but based upon other things written in scripture, there's a really good chance, highly likely, that it was on the northern shore somewhere of the Sea of Galilee. Um, there's a place to the to the west of Capernaum that it could be, but it could also have been somewhere in the area of Bethsaida. It just, but it's somewhere on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee that this happened. And I just want you to see some pictures of the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, and I want you to notice some things that they have in common. These pictures, I want you to, what, all four of these pictures are gonna be two and two. They have something in common. So these first two pictures, here you have the Sea of Galilee. You're looking as if you're in the Sea of Galilee up onto the hillside, and you'll notice that it's a hillside. And then this picture, a little bit further down from that picture, is another hillside with the Sea of Galilee. If you go to the next slide, here now you're just kind of looking in the opposite direction. Here you're on the hillside looking into the Sea of Galilee, and here you're on the top of the hillside um, of that area. What was the one thing in common in all four pictures? Say it again. Hillside. Hillside. This was not a miracle that happened in a nice flat park. And so when you envision five, 10,000 people on a hillside, and now the disciples have to distribute it, they are not walking on a flat surface. They are going up and down and up and down and up and down. Also, there was not air conditioning on the hillside of the Sea of Galilee back then, okay? There isn't any today either, but it wasn't like air conditioned, sitting in comfortable seats. No, you're on the grass, and these disciples are going up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, making sure that everybody gets something as much as they wanted. This morning, you get one bag, that's it, okay? But in the story, you got to keep eating until you were full. And so, I don't know, the disciples have to go to the same groups of people more than once? Again, just envision this. Imagine how long it took. We tend to kind of have this sanitized version of how these miracles work. But think about it. Some of you have already eaten all of your fishy crackers, and there are people in the back that haven't gotten theirs yet. Okay, now if you want, you can say, nah, 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 nah. You know, you can do that. But again, there were, on the hillside, think about it, there were lots of people that already had finished eating and other people were probably still waiting. Okay, this wasn't like all clean and perfectly done and all kind of, now who hasn't gotten fishy crackers yet? Will we, raise your hand. If you haven't gotten fishy crackers, raise your hand high. Okay, Jesus would be disappointed if not everyone got to benefit from the miracle. So let's make sure that everyone get, now, if you've already gotten fishy crackers, don't raise your hand again. We have enough for one for everybody. Okay, no seconds. Okay, keep your hands up high if you haven't gotten any. Disciples, we got some over here. Anybody over here not get any? I bet you they said that a lot on the whole side. I'll be right back. Okay, I'll be right back. Everyone over here, no, everyone's got some? Okay, here, anyone not get any? This whole section? Here, anyone in this whole section not get any? Oh, there's one person in the back that someone's pointing to. They seem to be shy. They won't raise their hand themselves. I'm not sure what that means. If you have an allergy to these, give them to your neighbor. It's fine, okay? Everyone over here, you got some fishy crackers. Okay, you can just put those down. Great job, disciples. It's here for the disciples. Good chance I'm going to kick one of these down before we're done, but that's okay. Now, look, we took the time to do this because I wanted you to get just some sense that Jesus multiplied the food, and that is the miracle, but the miracle doesn't happen without the little boy, and the miracle doesn't happen without the disciples. Childlike faith, 
Childlike faith prompts participation. Jesus provided the food to be multiplied, but the miracle doesn't happen without the disciples. They had to distribute it. Again, as the passage says, verse 9, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? And then verses 11 to 13, Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they had, had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. I don't know if you caught that, but after the disciples went up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, I'll be right back. Do you need more? Do you need more? After they did that for, I don't know, for how long? They sat down, they got a chance to eat, and then Jesus says, go get the leftovers. If I'm a disciple, I'm like, are you kidding? Leftovers? You gotta be kidding me. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Go get the leftovers. Following Jesus is not a spectator sport. We can't follow Jesus and just sit there and do nothing. We participate as followers of Jesus. It's part of the deal. And again, who is more likely to participate in something? Kids or adults? The phrase, we are going to play a game, gets different reactions from kids and adults, right? You say we are going to play a game to kids, and they're like hungry seagulls on the beach trying to get your food. Me, me, me. I want to play me first. Can I go? Can I go first? I want to play. I want to play. I want to play. You say, we're going to play a game to adults. And they act like teenagers not wanting to go to school. Oh, do I have to play a game? I'm so tired. Can I just watch the game? Right? That's what we do. But following Jesus is not a spectator sport. Childlike faith prompts participation. Remember this story, the picture, this, when the crippled man was lowered through the roof by his friends to get to Jesus, and the passage says that Jesus saw their faith, that's the faith of the friends, and he healed the man. Or how about this story, where the walls of Jericho fell, and do you remember what they had to do for that to happen? They had to walk around the city for six days. And then on the seventh day, they had to walk around the city seven times. And then when they were done with all that, everybody had to scream. When God works in our lives, he expects us, he wants us to participate. And following Jesus involves two things that kids do all the time. Okay, one is waiting. If we're going to follow Jesus, there are going to be times that we have to wait. And kids are always waiting, right? In the car, kids, when you're waiting in the car, what do you say? Are we there there yet? Thank you. (laughs) Parents, we hear that in our sleep, don't we? Okay? At school, the kids, they have to wait for recess, and they have to wait for lunch, and they have to wait to get picked up. At home, okay, in my home, when my kids were younger, Okay, they could ask me anything. They could ask me a can I question or they could ask me a do you know where question. You know, they'd be like, Dad, can I do this or can I do that? Or they'd say, hey, Dad, do you know where this is? Do you know where that is? And it didn't matter what kind of can I question it was or do you know where question is. My response was always, let's wait until your mom gets home. (laughs) And then we'll ask her right? Kids are always waiting. And here, I love this little, you may have missed this part in the story, uh, verses 5 to 7. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy, buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And so Philip answered him, It would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. I love it. In the passage, it says Jesus already knew what he was going to do, but he was just, I don't know, was he messing with Philip? Was he just making Philip? He was making Philip wait. He made them wait to see what would happen. 
Psalm 27, and there's lots of places in scripture that say something like this, but Psalm 27, 14 says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Sometimes God wants you to wait before he acts, and sometimes God wants you to move. And that's something else that kids do all the time. They are always moving. What do adults say about kids? You can go in the octagon after the service, and you'll probably say it if you watch the kids. I wish I had that kind of energy, right? Because kids are always moving. Remember when we could do that? I don't know how I ever moved like that. Okay, kids are always moving moving. And sometimes Jesus will say, it's time to move. In verses 11 to 12 of the story, Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. And when they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. He told the disciples, move. I've got the miracle, now you move and get the food to the people. And the Bible is filled with stories like this when it's time to move, whether it's the time where the crossing of the Red Sea happened. Remember this story? Okay, Moses is leading the people out of Egypt and the Egyptian army is coming up behind him and the Red Sea parts. And I just find it hysterical that Moses had to tell the people, that's our sign to move, let's go. And so they move. Or what about the time when Joseph and Mary, they flee to Egypt why? Because they were told in a dream that the baby's life is in danger, baby Jesus. And if they would have waited and not moved, baby Jesus wouldn't have made it. Okay? So sometimes when God says move, we need to move. But every time God acts in our lives, sometimes we have to move, sometimes we have to wait, but we have to do something. Childlike faith prompts participation. And so how does Jesus want you to participate? Is he asking you to wait? Or is he telling you to move? Then you should move. Okay. But childlike faith prompts us to pursue hope. Now there are lots of reasons not to be hopeful and I don't think I need to create a list with all those reasons. But life is hard. And it seems like there was always something to get us down. But if you think about kids and childlike faith, again, they don't have the resources to handle everyday life. Kids are not equipped to face the things that adults face. Children are dependent upon someone else. And yet, who is more hopeful in general, children or adults? For the most part, kids are more hopeful. And why is that? I think it's pretty simple. You see, kids know, they know that their well-being depends on someone else. Now, yes, there are responsibilities that kids have. Kids are expected to listen. Kids are expected to learn. Kids are expected to grow. But kids know, they know, that their well-being depends on someone else. And they're more hopeful. Adults forget that their well-being depends on someone else. Sometimes they don't know. Now, yes, adults, we have more responsibilities. We also have more abilities. But sometimes, adults, we forget some of our responsibilities because the three responsibilities that kids have don't disappear when we become adults. Remember the three? Listen, learn, and grow. And sometimes we're so busy taking care of everything else, we forget those three. And we forget that our well-being depends on someone else. Hope is a magnet. We are naturally drawn to things that give us hope. Hope, it's a magnet. And so we are drawn to things in the past that give us hope. You know, later in that same chapter, John chapter 6, if you're still there in your Bible, just scroll down to verse 31. And this is after the feeding of the 5,000. In verse 31, the people say to Jesus, our ancestors ate 
the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. That's a reference to a story you can find in Exodus 16. In fact, if you go to the back of your outline, if you have your outline, there's a Bible reading tool, and I've assigned ex Exodus 16. You, I would encourage you to go and read that story and learn about that old story of the manna in the desert that God provided. But you see, the Israelites, they would tell that story of how God provided this bread in the desert in a miraculous way. They would tell that story to their children from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And that story would give them hope. And in Jesus' day, the Israelites were living under foreign rule once again, the brutal rule of the Romans. And that story and others like it from their past, it gave them hope. And now they've experienced a story a lot like it. I want to encourage you to read the stories of Jesus, his healings, his love, his sacrifice, as it says in John chapter 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Folks, we need to be familiar with these stories because we are drawn to things in the past that give us hope. We are also drawn to things in the present that give us hope. Um, yesterday afternoon, we just got back on Thursday, Friday, and part of Saturday, dropped our oldest, uh, our son, Robert, um, to the, off at Salt Lake, University of Utah, off to college. And so it begins. And University of Utah was his number one choice for school ever since we did a campus visit um, a little over um, the spring of his junior year. And that was his number one. But as late as this past May, we weren't sure how he was going to pay for it. You notice how I phrased that? We weren't sure how he was going to pay for it. So I want to catch that. Okay. Um, and now, he had done well in school, and he had some really good scholarships. But in May, he still had this huge, huge financial gap. And then in June, this miracle job just kind of popped out of nowhere. Thanks, Mark. Um, this miracle job popped out of nowhere. And he was able to earn what he needed. And the funny thing is back in May, um, my son, Robert, he was really confident that God was going to work this whole thing out. I wasn't. I was not confident. I'm like, this ain't, I don't know, Robert. We got to come up with a contingency plan. Because In fact, we did. We came up with a contingency plan because I didn't see this happening. Now, you can call the miracle job in June a coincidence, but I can't. For me and my son, Jesus showed up. And it, yeah, you can applaud, that's great. And, and to me, okay, forget about the details, the de you know, the college, all that stuff. It was just a great reminder to me that God is looking out for my son and he will take better care of my son than I ever could. And I need those kinds of reminders in the present to give me hope. Why were there 5,000 people following Jesus? Well, it tells us in verse 2 of the story, it says, a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Jesus did things in their presence that had them believing. And so they wanted to see what Jesus would do next. Do we have the childlike faith to recognize when Jesus shows up? Because if we do, we're going to want to see what he's going to do next. We are drawn to things in the present that will give us hope. And we are also drawn to things in the future that give us hope. The people who Jesus fed, they were looking for the Messiah, a Savior, someone who would deliver them from the Romans and give them a better future. And in verse 14, at the end of the miracle, they say this, about Jesus. They say, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they, said, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. They were looking for a savior who would give them a better future. And I think one of the reasons why, why kids' lives are full of hope 
is because they have so much of their lives in front of them. Their best years are still in front of them. But I don't think our age really matters. It doesn't matter how old you are. I don't care how old you are. We need to believe, because of our faith in Jesus, that our best years are still in front of us. It doesn't mean that everything in our future will be wonderful, but we need to believe, because of our faith, and I don't care how old you are, that our best years are still in front of us. What Jesus did on the cross, at the empty tomb, gave us eternal hope, dying on the cross, rising again from the dead. It's a hope for this life, absolutely, but it's also an eternal hope. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You know, in the last 12 months, we've had quite a few people here, part of the TFRC community, family, who've passed away. In fact, I went back and I just looked from August of last year to this year, everyone we've lost. Um, we've lost Sarah Mercer, John Sexton, Lois Rohe, Gail Lewis, Judy Pruitt, Ann Smith, Bert Mason, John McCandless, Arnold Bridge, Bob Sears, Tos Tasha Moshak, Mike Hutchings, and Joyce Anderson. That's a lot of loss. And many of you knew at least one of them, if not many of them. Uh, these were people that on some level I knew, all of them. I knew some better than others, interacted with some more than others. But what I believe about these people that we've lost, again, all these people were people of faith in Jesus. And I believe because of the eternal hope they have, their best days are in front of them. Just like our best days are in front of us because of the eternal life that they get to experience and that for those of us in faith in Jesus, we get to experience. Our age doesn't matter. We have eternal hope. And if we believe in Jesus, our best days are ahead of us. We have to believe that. Yeah, you can applaud at that. And so whether it's our past, our present, our future, we are drawn to things that give us hope. Jesus has acted in our lives before, and Jesus will act in our lives again, and we just have to believe like children to see it. Please pray with me. And Lord, again, I thank you for childlike faith. That is what you call us to. And I would ask that you would soften all of our hearts so that we can believe like children, become like children as you told us to. And Lord, I would ask that you would help us see how you've acted in our lives in the past and the present and give us hope for the future. And Lord, our futures are not all gonna be rosy or great, but Lord, help us believe that regardless of what happens in the future, that our best days are still in front of us because of you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.